Right now on News 3, a planned vote tonight to continue construction on the Judge Doyle Square project downtown. And the city is looking at options to expand a waterfront park, how they hope to do it and how much it would cost. And later, Governor Tony Evers takes more executive action, signing new legislation today to help make health care more affordable. This is News 3 at 6. Thanks for joining us. Tonight's city council meeting begins in about a half hour and alders have a lot to discuss. One of the big ticket items is a new proposal put forward by the mayor to help move the Judge Doyle Square project forward. And another $5 million proposal is being introduced to further develop a popular city park. We have team coverage of both items tonight. News 3's Keely Arthur is downtown with an update on the Judge Doyle Square project and Amanda and Donna with how the city is hoping to expand Olin Park. Let's start with Keely live downtown. Keely. News tonight, Madison Mayor Paul Soglin is offering another solution. He says might get this thing back on track. That is what the city council is voting on tonight. Now, as a refresher, you'll remember that the Judge Doyle Square project is a $186 million development in the downtown Madison area. It would include a hotel, apartments, retail and office space and a parking garage. The project has stalled over disagreements between the city and private developer Beitler Real Estate. Soglin is now proposing this city take over more of the project from Beitler as a way to move things along. Now, in order to take back part of the project from Beitler, the city would have to pay Beitler $700,000. That is what the city is voting on tonight. Now, this project has been stalled since November. Obviously, a lot of council members want to see something happen, but it's unclear how the vote will go tonight. We'll try to bring you the latest and hopefully a resolution tonight on News 3 at 10. Keely Arthur live downtown. Keely, thank you. And the city could be expanding Olin Park, adding an area of Lake Monona shoreline that has been private now for more than 60 years. Our Amanda Quintana live near Olin Park with more on the resolution being announced at tonight's council meeting. Amanda. Yes, well, if you've walked or biked along Lake Monona, you know that when you get to John Nolan, you get to the intersection here, you kind of have to loop around this building here to get to Olin Park. But for $5.5 million, the city could buy this land that this building is on and give you access to the shoreline. Ask most Madisonians, they'll say the shoreline is the place to be, especially for runners and bikers. I mean, the lakes are, are what make us special. But imagine this is your view during a meeting. It's a beautiful view. The staff is really going to miss it, and uh, myself included. The Wisconsin Medical Society's headquarters has been in this spot since 1955, keeping this 450 feet of Lake Monona shoreline private. But as the society has downsized, less and less people get to enjoy this scene. Now they want to sell the three and a half acres of land to the city for $5.5 million. The one caveat we uh, had was that they uh, uh, used it for parkland and continue to use it for parkland. You just don't see properties like that. Alder Alan Arnson says he's seen a lot of support for the idea that he will announce at tonight's city council meeting. It's a lot of money, but Arnson says it's fair for such a special spot. It'll be paid for by park impact fees, a fund set aside to develop parklands like this one. As of right now, it really will, it'll just extend the green space. The city is going to evaluate the building to say, okay, is this building a keeper or should it be taken down for more park space? Plans to connect the land to Olin Park will come later. Later. Right now, anyone taking a path on John Nolan is forced to loop around the Medical Society. Some choose to run through, but linking it all, keeping the path closer to the lake, could make your run easier and more beautiful, a plan the city has had for a long time. This shoreline will be there for the public. People are really supportive of that. Opening the space up for the first time in more than 60 years, possibly next month. There's just a few of us here, and... Uh... Now that's going to be shared by everybody. Now tonight that resolution is being introduced, but it still needs to go to the Parks Commission and then the City Council still has to vote on it. Now the CEO here at the Wisconsin Medical Society tells me that if all goes well, he thinks that the sale will close in February. All right, Amanda, thank you. We will have updates on both of these stories tonight 
on News 3 at 10. We turn things over to weather now. Meteorologist Dave Caulfield joins us now. He has our first alert forecast. Dave? We did see the sunshine today, Eric and Charlotte, but it was blown away, if you will, by the strong winds that we've been dealing with all day as a cold front comes through southern Wisconsin. Still dealing with some gusty winds tonight in Madison. You can see the view high above my head on the WISC-TV Skycam. We have partly to mostly cloudy skies. A few snowflakes still out and about, but nothing that we need to concern ourselves with. Temperatures are falling through the 20s this evening to 29 right now in Madison, 36 in Janesville, 30 even in Monroe, and down to 21 closer to La Crosse in Viroqua. Wind gusts of about 30 to 40 miles per hour still showing up across southern Wisconsin, helping wind chills fall into the teens in Madison and single digits a little bit farther to the north and west, and wind chills will continue to fall through the teens into the single digits into early Wednesday morning, and some of us could be starting off Wednesday morning feeling like it's below zero outside and tomorrow cold and windy once again across southern Wisconsin with highs in the low 20s. I'll tell you how long this cold weather will last plus what to expect for this weekend in your first alert forecast in just a few minutes. All right, Dave, thanks. A jury trial underway for the Marshall man accused of killing Jesse Faber last year. 60 year old Daniel Leeski has already pleaded guilty to hiding Faber's body but says he did not kill him intentionally. And that's what jurors will decide in the coming days. The criminal complaint alleges last January 15th, Leesky shot and killed Faber, who was from Sun Prairie, and then moved his body to a storage unit in Rio, where it was found rolled inside a rug and plastic sheeting. Leesky claims he killed Faber in self-defense. Next week will mark 90 days since the disappearance of Jamie Kloss, and investigators are planning to give the public an update on their investigation next Wednesday. The 13-year-old disappeared from her barren Wisconsin home on October 15th. Her parents were found shot dead inside the home. Barron County Sheriff Chris Fitzgerald says there this is still an active case and he will provide as much information as he can without jeopardizing the investigation. Wisconsin's new governor says he intends to follow through on his campaign pledges. In his first full day on the job, Governor Tony Evers has already signed four executive orders. Rose Schmidt joins us in studio to tell us about day one. Rose. Yes, well, Governor Evers says during listening sessions around the state, people told him they want access to affordable health care. Now he's taking the, what may be the first step in guaranteeing that. Folks, let's poker tonight and get to work tomorrow. With Governor Evers' first day on the job, he's getting to work. We feel important that we meet the um, promises that we made in this campaign, and we'll be doing that. Starting with health care. One executive order Evers signed Tuesday directs state agencies to make plans to protect people with pre-existing conditions. We heard loud and clear that uh, there's the fact that there's 2.4 million people in Wisconsin that uh, have pre-existing conditions. And uh, we need to have that protection, especially that protection that that we find under the Federal F Affordable Care Act. The other health care order he signed calls for the Department of Health Services to develop a plan making sure people have access to health care by expanding Medicaid. The pair of orders fall short of many promises Evers made in 2018, but during an event in La Crosse Tuesday, he said he still plans to accept federal Medicaid expansion money and says stay tuned for more action. As we promised during the campaign that we would be asking uh, the Attorney General to uh, to withdraw uh, the Wisconsin from that lawsuit that uh, would essentially end the Affordable Care Act. Something he said he will do in the near future, but a Republican-controlled legislature could make that difficult. Evers also signed two executive orders yesterday. One bans discrimination of state workers based on gender identity and sexual orientation, and the other calls for respecting state employees. Rose Schmidt in studio with us tonight. Rose, thank you. Senator Tammy Baldwin has asked military investigators to look into allegations of sexual assault and harassment within Wisconsin Air National Guard's 115th Fighter Wing, which is based right here in Madison. The senator sent a letter to Air Force investigators in mid-November after a master sergeant in the Security Force Squadron wrote her a letter where he outlined several cases of misconduct against female members. A spokeswoman for the 115th Fighter Wing says the unit doesn't tolerate such behavior and takes allegations seriously. Going on right now until 10 o'clock tonight, the Culver's and Lake Mills holding a fundraiser for fallen Lake Mills fire captain Chris Truman, who was hit and killed by a vehicle on the Beltline on New Year's Eve while helping a stranded driver. 10% of the proceeds tonight are being given to Chris's fiance Amber. So far, the fundraiser has been a success.
for We've us. actually seen quite a bit of regional fire departments come yep. through already. Sun Prairie was through and, and a few others that, um, you know, they are a big family. Firemen, policemen, all responders. And we're a family operation that wants to uh, support that. And we support this community like a family as well. And there is still plenty of time to get out there. Again, the fundraiser goes until 10 o'clock tonight. And still ahead at 6, a popular Chicago-based pizza chain is coming to Madison. And a slow start to winter, putting a damper on local businesses that rely on the snow. You're watching News 3 at 6. Welcome back. Giordano's, the popular Chicago-based deep dish pizza chain, intends to open a location here in Madison. At one point, Giordano's did have a location in Milwaukee, but that closed back in 2002. There are currently none here in Wisconsin, so the future Madison location will mark a return to the state. According to the Giordano's website, it also plans to bring a, lo a location to Kenosha. While many of us are enjoying the warmer temperatures, the unseasonable weather is not so good for winter events and activities. Many local cold weather plans have been postponed or canceled. News 3's Adam Dexter tells us the impact this could have on southern Wisconsin's economy. Well, the ice castles at Lake Geneva were expected to bring thousands of people to this community, but so far a warm winter has delayed the event multiple times. Today I took a look at how this mild winter is affecting people all over southern Wisconsin. Crews in Lake Geneva are still working to get ice castles prepared for the public. The attraction was scheduled to open weeks ago, but warm weather got in the way. The warm rain has just wreaked havoc on them. Taking a hit on the local economy. It's still impactful. It's definitely uh, some of our businesses have felt a little bit of the stress of, you know, you know, the weather, the, you know, going up and down and not having snow or not being cold enough to do some things. But it's not just like Geneva. High temperatures across southern Wisconsin peaked into the 40s again today. Businesses like Foxy's in Janesville specialize in winter gear and say they're also taking a hit. Definitely hurts, hurts sales quite a bit. Um, I would say we're probably down about 10% over last year. Haley says the main thing not selling is snowmobile gear. In Rock County, trails have yet to open this year. Hard for the salesmen and the snowmobilers alike. I've seen winters where we've never opened a trail but never winters where there's no snow. And well, it's doubtful if the trails will open in Rock County this season. Back in Lake Geneva, the hope of a late winter is still strong. This is Wisconsin, so I truly believe that although we really haven't gotten into full swing yet, it's gonna come into full swing. 
Tom Monaro says this is the first year the ice castles have come to Lake Geneva, and they're hoping to finish and open the attraction mid-January. Still ahead tonight in sports, Matt LaFleur heading to Green Bay today. We'll have an update on the Packers head coaching position in just a few moments. But first, a windy evening around Madison and temperatures will be dropping in the coming days. Meteorologist Dave Caulfield will have his extended forecast next. All right, meteorologist Dave Caulfield giving us the very latest on our forecast, and hopefully we'll see some of these winds die down, Dave. Yeah, I hope so too, Eric and Charlotte, but the bad news is into tomorrow, it's still going to be quite breezy, windy, in fact, still for much of southern Wisconsin. That wind is helping with the formation of some flurries, especially north and east of Madison. A few snowflakes out and about as a cold front passes over us. That's what's helping to spark these winds as well, but really not too much showing up on radar, not anything that we need to worry about in precipitation land as we head into tonight. High temperatures today made it into the low 40s once again in Madison, 43 in Janesville, the upper 30s in the Dells, but it really did not feel like that for much of the day because of that very brisk northwesterly wind. Our January temperatures, though, they've been anything but typical January temperatures. Check out this monthly departure so far, 12 and a half degrees ahead of where we should be for this time of year. And the, some of these numbers I had to double check because they were so high, but it's in fact what we received. Temperatures in the 40s and 50s a couple of days so far this January, but I think typical wintertime temperatures will visit us over the next couple of days. So kind of a return to normalcy across southern Wisconsin. Our time lapse in Madison, we had a little bit of tricky weather in some spots early this morning. Then the sunshine came out and then the clouds. So we've really had a little bit of everything on this Tuesday. Right now we're looking at mostly cloudy sky in downtown Madison on the Edgewater Skycam. Temperatures have fallen from those 40s early on 
to the 20s in Madison, still in the mid 30s in Janesville, 31 in Watertown and 26 in Lone Rock. And over the last 24 hours, our peak wind gusts across southern Wisconsin, 35 to 45 miles per hour, close to 50 close to Decorah, Iowa, and we're still looking at that wind advisory where winds could still gust about 40 miles per hour until 9 p.m. for much of southern Wisconsin for Dane County and areas south for the next few hours and wind chills because of those gusty winds are still in the teens in Madison and we are in the single digits. Those wind chills will continue to tumble for tonight, but temperatures overall, especially after we get through Wednesday and Thursday, where we're going to be a little bit closer to normal, are back into the 30s and then closer to 40 by the time we get to next week. So these cold temperatures not lasting all that long seems to be the theme of January 2019 so far. Tonight, windy and colder becoming partly cloudy. Temperatures will fall into the mid teens. Wind chills could be down to about minus five by the time we start tomorrow morning. Mostly sunny, colder and windy for tomorrow. Highs will be in the low 20s. So our first day of 2019 with below normal high temperatures. That will be something to observe. Not really used to that just yet in the new year. Uh, future track showing the clouds on the decrease overnight. I think we'll see plenty of sunshine tomorrow, but that sunshine really doesn't help those temperatures that much because we still do have that northwesterly wind. So highs will be in the low 20s tomorrow and we could be starting off feeling like minus five in Madison, minus six in the Dells and closer to minus eight in Camp Douglas. So bundle up the kids for tomorrow morning and Thursday morning as well. Then as we head to Friday and Saturday, those temperatures a little bit warmer, but we do have the chance of a little bit of light snow or flurry activity late Friday into Saturday. The Packers have a deal in place with their new head coach. Now we're just waiting for him to get to Green Bay. Stories coming up in sports. Hi, I'm Michelle Carolla. Tonight on the News at 9, President Trump is set to address the nation about border security in the midst of a government shutdown. Details first on Fox at 9.
We're just waiting for official word from the Packers that Matt LaFleur is their next head coach. LaFleur is expected to travel to Green Bay sometime today and be introduced as head coach tomorrow. LaFleur is a native of Mount Pleasant, Michigan and was a quarterback at Saginaw Valley State College. He's getting a four-year contract from the Packers with an option on a fifth year. The 39-year-old LaFleur is married, has two children, both boys. This is the fourth different coaching job for him in the last four years, but this one is his biggest challenge yet, head coach of the Green Bay Packers. Badgers offensive coordinator Joe Rudolph is interviewed for the head coaching position at Temple. Bruce Feldman reports Rudolph was very impressive in that Temple interview. Rudolph played offensive line for the Badgers in the early 90s. He's in his fourth season as UW's offensive coordinator. He's familiar with the landscape out east. He was offensive coordinator for Paul Christ at Pittsburgh in 2012. The Badgers weren't ranked in the final Associated Press College football poll today. Clemson, of course, number one with Alabama number two. Ohio State's Rose Bowl win moved the Buckeyes up to third. Other Big Ten teams ranked Michigan 14th, Penn State 17th, Northwestern 21st, and Iowa 25th. Clemson got to number one by winning the national championship last night, 44-16 over Alabama. A lot of people thought Alabama might roll to another title, but Clemson freshman quarterback Trevor Lawrence threw for 347 yards and three touchdowns. A transfer of power in college football? Eh, maybe. Little brother's kind of grown up a little bit, and now, you know, we're a little more competitive. Um, and now we're, we kind of won the rubber match, if you will, in, uh, in the natties. Uh, it's 2-2 overall. And I told Coach Saban last night, he was very gracious after the game, and, and I just told him, I said, see you next year, because uh, I don't think they're going to go anywhere. The Badger men's basketball team plays Purdue at the Kohl Center Friday night at 8. A tough week for the Boilermakers. They're at Michigan State tonight, then in Madison at the end of the week. As far as the Badgers are concerned, they dropped out of the polls this week, but they're in pretty good shape, really. Wisconsin is 3-1 and one in the Big Ten, just a game out of first, and head coach Greg Gard says all in all, his team has been pretty solid so far this year. You know, other than a, a bad half at Western Kentucky defensively and, and the bad half offensively the other night against Minnesota here, we've been fairly consistent. Um, for the most part, we've had some ebbs and flows within halves, but we were really good defensively at Penn State. So for the most part, like I said, other than maybe a half, um, this group has understood what their identity is and has played pretty well. Our prep mini game of the week Thursday night features boys basketball on the Badgers South. Stoughton and Monona Grove renew their rivalry. You can watch the game live on Channel3000.com Thursday night, 7:15. Are the Brewers going to get pitcher Madison Bumgarner from the Giants? Well, the Giants and Brewers are said to have serious communication, and the Brewers appear to be the most engaged team in trade talks. GM David Stern showed last year he's not afraid to make deals, as in trading for Christian Yelich, and getting Bumgarner would signal the Brewers are going for it again in 2019. Now, he was good four years ago, but had some injury problems. Might, might be uh, over the hill now, but hey, everybody says they need yeah, pitching, right? Window's still there for the Brewers, you would think. Yeah. Okay, and not too far away from pitchers and catchers reporting final check of the weather yeah it felt like spring training earlier on uh, this month but temperatures are a little bit more winter like over the next few days that wind advisory still in effect until 9 p.m. for southern Wisconsin wind chills right now are in the teens and single digits and that's where they'll remain as we head into later tonight and we could start off tomorrow feeling like below zero all right Dave thanks thanks for joining us enjoy your evening and we'll see you back here at 10